Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. Welcome, Nick. Can you introduce yourself to our audience, please? Sure. Um, my name is Nick Barry Shaw. I'm the trade and privatization campaigner with the Council of Canadians. Uh, but these days, my job title is probably more like PharmaCare campaigner. Trade and privatization. That's uh, a lot of a lot of to unpack there alone. I know we came here to talk about PharmaCare, but it was like, oh, snap. The Council of Canadians, for folks who have no idea what that is. Can you give us the Coles notes? Yeah, um, the Council of Canadians was founded back in 1985, uh, mainly as a kind of a left nationalist organization opposed to free trade. And it was very much in that kind of left nationalist mold. Um, certainly the person affiliated with the council that people would know the best would be Maude Barlow, who was the chairperson for many, many, many years and played a kind of pivotal role in the fight against uh, free trade in, in the late 80s and then against NAFTA and against the trade agreements like the MAI and the FTAA for those of that generation for whom those acronyms mean something. Um, these kind of free trade deals that were being drafted by corporations in the, in the years when history was supposed to have ended uh, and they were just going to kind of steamroll or over everybody. And so the council played a pretty important role in, in organizing and, and mobilizing Canadians in those various fights in the, in the 80s, late 80s, 90s, and, and into the 2000s. And since then, you know, trade has been, uh, continues to be an important part of what the council does, um, but also fighting against especially healthcare privatization and fighting for the expansion of the public healthcare system has always been a key, a key element of what the council is about. And, um, so yeah, I think in general we are one of the few like genuinely membership-based and membership-funded organizations out there that have a national reach. We ha get 92% of our funding from our members, from donations. Um, we have, I believe, 42 chapters uh, across the country. Um, and certainly for me as someone coming to this from from, from Montreal, I'm based in Montreal. I grew up in Montreal, I've done, lived my whole life in Montreal. And so being involved in kind of uh, the radical left in Montreal, and I'm sure it's the case in many other places, it's mostly rooted in universities, in, uh, in larger cities, and often you don't have much reach outside of those places. And so the council is very different in that regard because we have chapters in smaller and mid-sized towns like all across the country and so as an organizer that's been really fascinating and interesting to be able to to kind of be planning and working on campaigns that have a different kind of scope than than what I've been familiar with in in, in previous work. This is like totally off topic and I wasn't going to bring it up but the four Canadians in the name makes me cringe just like I'm a staunch anti-nationalist. And I understand in the context of the free trade and the way that especially the CAW where the auto workers were being controlled by an American union without their best interest. And so this left it, but you said the term, so I have to talk about it, right? I was like, you can't drop leftist nationalist without maybe unpacking a little bit so folks understand because anything nationalist now, uh, especially with the word Canadian, in it has a real different flavor to it, if you know what I'm saying, right? It kind yes, of comes. It does. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I wonder, does it still have a really nationalist focus, or do you want to maybe address yeah, <laughs> what I've just would, thrown at you? No, no, I, I and I, I totally get that. Um, yeah, the Council of Canadians, it's right there in the name. There have definitely been discussions within the organization, within the membership about changing the name. Um, I think those discussions are always complicated. So we've stuck with what we have. I think ideologically, the organization has kind of moved a substantial distance away from left nationalism. It's not 
uh, as important a part of our rhetoric, of our ideology, um, and so on. But I think at the same time, it's still important for, for a good number of our members and, and supporters. Um, but I think, yeah, like if you follow, you know, the kind of trajectory of like what Maud Barlow was saying, you know, and what she's done, you know, um, you know, to the council's credit, I mean, I've only been working with the council for like two years now, but I think you could kind of trace an arc uh, where the council kind of evolved out of a kind of more basic left nationalism where everyone from, from Maud Barlow to Mel Watkins to Paul Martin, which blew me away when I was reading, <laughs> was like they were part of the founding group, you know, so it was a very like broad and I would say not actually that left nationalism in some ways at the beginning. Um, and moved in a much more internationalist direction, um, you know, various campaigns around around water, which has been really important for the council over the last, you know, decades, um, have done a lot of work with First Nations communities uh, around these things. Um, when uh, Wet'suwet'en was happening, that was shortly before I joined the organization. I know the council was fairly involved. Is in, is happening well yeah there's it's ongoing but when the the rail blockades and stuff when it was at its peak uh the council was fairly involved in that i understand and so yeah i think i think the name i think yeah it still poses a problem for some people and yeah it i be. think it's just kind of a gut reaction for me at this point even when i dig deep it's just like when i read it anytime someone uses the rhetoric actually of four canadians when they're talking about federal policy worries me because uh your citizenship actually isn't dependent on a lot of federal programs, nor should it be, right? And so uh, that's kind of politician talk. But we don't want to get too far off topic. We do really want to unpack pharmacare and the legislation that recently passed, which, you know, arguably definitely a victory for those who've been advocating for pharmacare, uh, which has not seen any movement in a very, very long time, despite many election promises by the victor. It's not like it, we were banking on a single party to win there. Uh, the liberals have promised this for a long, long time. Um, and so back in late February, early, anyway, not that long ago, you wrote a piece, what I would describe as like a victory piece, a celebratory piece with cautionary tales not definitely not like the NDP tweets that are coming out today that have me raging where they're just claiming they've delivered pharmacare and dental care and winter protection and all of these things that have just been delivered to us today. Uh, it's far more complex than that. So I'm glad you're here to kind of get people to understand the legislation. And then we'll talk about uh, the budget a little bit and what that means for pharmacare, plus all kinds of goodies in between. But um what excited you about the legislation for pharmacare? Because there was a lot, a lot of ways it could have gone. I think, yeah, first I should just say that um, the legislation has been introduced, but it hasn't been passed. So the, it's gone, th now it's in second reading. I mean, I'm learning about all the, the ar arcana of <laughs> parliamentary procedure by, by working on this campaign. But it's going to go to the committee and then it's going to go to third reading in the Senate. And so it'll probably get passed uh, sometime like in the fall of 2024. I think that's probably like an optimistic timeline. But it, the legislation that's been introduced, um, Bill C-64, I think is a victory uh, for, you know, the Council of Canadians and for our allies and the Canadian Health Coalition, the unions like the CLC that have been um, you know, fighting for this for many, many, many years. Uh, and a lot of the patient advocates and, uh, and other organizations that have been, have been fighting for this stuff uh, for a long time. And I think what we were particularly happy to see in there was first of all, it didn't have any out-of-pocket costs, right? So it's uh, what's called first dollar coverage in the legislation. So it means that when you go to the pharmacy and you're getting medications that are covered by this national plan, uh, you're going to get them with your health card. You're not going to be paying with a credit card. And I you think that's- You sound like Doug Ford for a second. It's he, a good he line. He said that to us it's a few times. It's a good line. I think I, we should rip it off. <laughs> it's a good line. Find a different way to deliver that. 
<laughs> no, no. I think I think we should totally appropriate the, You're reclaiming the sloganeering it? of the right of yeah, the right okay, when they when they come with a good one. Um, you know, and in this case, it is actually true. I mean, I think the, the thing about Doug Ford is like, yeah, that's how it should be, but it ain't what's going on with his uh, for, you know healthcare privatization schemes. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, but so that was important. So the fact that there's no out-of-pocket costs, uh, I think that's a that was a, a very important. The fact that it's universal uh, is huge, uh, meaning that it's it, uh, everyone covers everybody, right? It doesn't cover only you know at the system. The system we have now is this like public-private patchwork, right? Some people have workplace plans. Some people are covered by public plans that are run by the provinces. Uh, and some people have no coverage at all, and there's wildly different levels of coverage. Sometimes you have a big co-payment, sometimes you have a huge deductible, so you basically don't get any money back before you pay huge amounts out of pocket. Um, and so it's it's a it's a it's a mess, and there's lots of people who not only fall through the cracks, but a lot of people who even with the coverage that they have can't afford their meds. This is like the means testing we talk a lot about on the show that really gets me pissed off when means testing is introduced to any aspect of healthcare. It's a huge problem because also income levels are really hard to gauge. They're they lack nuance, family size, cost of living increases, or you know, whether you're in an urban or rural setting, none of that seems to matter. It's just a really arcane way to deliver something that everybody should have, right? And it, then it makes barriers too, right? Then there's paperwork and other steps that even if you do qualify, you don't because you don't understand or uh, don't complete the process correctly. So that absolutely is an important point for me too, because it's been a the dental care, I mean, I'm not even going to talk about it, but... No, no, it's actually important to talk about dental care because... Now you're going to get us all wrapped up. <laughs> that was what, uh, yeah, but that was what the insurance industry and uh, that's what Big Pharma really wanted. Like, if you read their lobbying briefs that they were submitting to the... For uh, Pharmacare, that's health, what they wanted for, for Pharmacare. Pharmacare. They were okay. kind of like in, in their, in their inter-industry meeting because Pharma and the insurers are constantly meeting and convening strategy sessions and thinking of how they can shape uh, pharmacare legislation. They were doing that even before the supply and confidence agreement kind of put pharmacare back on the political agenda. So they were gunning for something that would be basically a dental care style, means tested, only covers the uninsured, or is, you know, you have income cutoffs and so, so on. None of that, right? And I think that's that's really hugely important. And it was a big uh, defeat for the insurers. And if you look at what their main lobbying uh, industry association was saying afterwards. They were saying, we have serious concerns. They were really upset that the, they felt like the government hadn't listened to them and they'd been lobbying uh, the health ministry like crazy in the lead up. So, you know, I think that the universality is, is key because it, it really does entrench the principles that, you know, make our public health care system so, so widely loved and so effect effective in the in the pharmacare as it's going to roll out going forward. Let's talk about that industry lobbying a bit because although this was surprising that it didn't seem to take any of their input, some of their lobbying has been very successful uh, within the ministry within the cabinet. Uh, the breach did a great article. We'll link in our show notes. You guys opened up about that in your statement where heavy, heavy pressure. Like I don't think folks realize the amount of layers of lobbying that are involved. I, Nick touched on it being pharma and insurance companies colluding and working together. We're talking about like entire teams of highly paid professionals that spend their entire time and effort trying to pressure governments in different ways, kind of like Nick does, but for <laughs> evil, you know, um, and much bigger oh, teams with a lot fancier yeah. offices, I imagine. I, I hope think so, because yes. your money should be going <laughs> elsewhere. Um, but you know what I mean? And it's on top of that, they have think tanks and other kinds of policy type groups that do that work for them or that they create themselves sometimes. It's just so much. And it, they're usually quite successful. So although I'm always very skeptical of any legislation passed these days, like I... I, there are these pluses are really big considering 
Um, but you call them they a lot. Can we name some names? Like, we love to talk about blah, blah. Like, when we're talking about other issues, we know who to really go after. Who are the biggest players in Canada that are pushing to for a, a lesser pharmacare? Yeah, that would be, I mean, there's the big name pharmaceutical corporations like Pfizer, like Johnson & Johnson, like GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, AbV, you know, um, there's a fairly long list of them. I've been compiling. I didn't the want to list. hear that. I just need one. I have to focus oh, there's my too energy. Many. And they have they have so many resources behind them. Um, so they haven't I've even been gotten tracking. into the insurers yet. No, no. So that's yeah, that's that's pharma, and then they have their industry body, which is called Innovative Medicines Canada, and that sort of is, you know, regroups all of these brand name drug manufacturers in Canada. And, uh, you know, the CEO of, of Innovative Medicines Canada is routinely recognized as one of the most influential lobbyists on the Hill. Um, and then on the insurance side, you have, we have really like three big insurers in Canada. We have Manulife, uh, Canada Life, um, and Sun Life. Those are like the big three. Uh, another one that kind of stands out because I've been going through the lobbying data for a while now is uh, Green Shield Canada, which is surprising because it's in, close to some of the union movement. They work a lot with Unifor um, and the, a lot of unions have their insurance plans with Green Shields because it's technically a nonprofit. But they are part, along with the, the big three insurers, they actively participate in the industry lobbying group called uh, CLIA, which is a very unfortunate acronym, uh, Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association. So uh, they, they are very involved and they're, they've been lobbying as much as some of these really big players that have like 10, 20 times the revenues. And so again, this is something I haven't, like this is pure speculation on my part, but I'm like, how the hell is this like small insurance company that's supposedly nonprofit playing such a big role in fighting public single payer pharmacare. They have run uh, paid uh, like um, sponsored content in the Globe and Mail. They did a day long seminar hosted by Andre Picard uh, that they sponsored. Uh, they have done uh, a pilot project that they announced saying, you know, don't do a universal system we're going to show you how to just do pharmacare for, you know, for the poorest of the poor, for the oh, people who have absolutely no Oh, we know what that would known. look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so really, and but presenting it as like this, you know, of course we care about the struggling, uh, you know, low-income workers, and those are the people that we're doing this for. And don't do a universal thing that's just giving money to wealthy people. Um, so really bizarre kind of class politics masking what is obviously an industry agenda. So I'm like... I know we know that they've been funded by a pharmaceutical company. We don't know which one, right? Because uh, it was anonymous and no, no one's done any digging. I haven't had time to do any digging on that, but like obviously they're working hand in glove, right? Uh, obviously like they're, they're punching above their weight because somebody's giving them money. Um, and so those are the really the two kind of, those are the players on the two sides, on the insurance side and the pharma side. And yeah, I mean, we're up against a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of, yeah, a lot of capitalist power for sure. I don't like, have you ever seen the, have you ever seen the movie? Thank you for smoking. I haven't. Sounds good though. <laughs> it, it follows the life of a lobbyist for the tobacco industry. He dines with the head lobbyist for the firearms industry. And I think pharmaceuticals, I can't remember what, but they were like three vices. I can't remember. And you might appreciate it now having to do what you do, but it does give the impression it's just like one person uh, lobbying on behalf of all of these huge things. And that's really not what it's like now. I mean, maybe it was in the 80s, but that is a huge conglomerate uh, forced to be up against a member funded organization, I imagine there's probably not a lot of groups dedicating massive amounts of resources to grassroots uh, pharmacare organizing. There's just so many issues to fight for. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is an issue that the council has been you know, pushing for in various ways since 2000. But 
um, you know, going into, I guess, shortly after the supply and confidence deal was signed, and we were even working on a campaign on Pharmacare before that, but with the supply and confidence agreement, we were like, okay, this is an actual opportunity. We have a chance to fight for something here. We know the Liberals are very weak and they've only gotten weaker. They're depending on the NDP to um, prop them up. And they've made this formal commitment to pass legislation, right? To bring legislation on pharmacare. And so, you know, like, yeah, let's, let's try to concentrate our energies on that. And let's, you know, try to raise the temperature as much as possible. Let's try to be strategic. So we did a lot of like mapping of ridings and looking at who the MPs were that were really on the bubble on the liberal side, looking at, uh, you know, who's in cabinet and who is probably going to lose the next election. So like, you know, that versus like an MP in the Anglophone part of Montreal. It's like, who doesn't you know, need to not, listen to anybody yeah, except whoever funds to his elections. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, they probably don't even need funding for their election. They're just going to get uh, out. The war chest what. is full. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we did a lot of that kind of pre-planning, um, for the campaign and, um, yeah, I mean, I think it made sense and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with what we've been able to achieve. I don't think it's, you know, immodest to say that we've been playing an outsized role because we put the time in and we've been trying to, you know, doing a lot of work. I think one of the orientations that we actually learned in part from the pharma industry itself was the importance of patient voices. Um, and so making connections with people who have diabetes, people who have a, a kid with a rare disease, um, you know, uh, people who, who have been through the struggle themselves, right, who have found themselves confronted with these ridiculously high drug costs, and in many cases have paid for it, not only with out of pocket, but with their health, right, um, and who can speak to that of just how dire the need is for pharmacare. And so we've built relationships with a number of people um, like that who could be spokespeople, and, you know, we organized an 18 city tour um, of Pharmacare kind of town halls where we made sure to give these people kind of a platform to speak out alongside experts. And, um, and yeah, and I think, you know, that was sort of, we were in part drawing inspiration from the Machiavellian kind of workings of big pharma, right? Because they understand who their worst enemy is, right? They understand that like the thing that is kryptonite for them is like, People like Erin Little, this woman from Port Elgin, Ontario, whose daughter has a rare disease and a pharma company came along and bought the rights to her drug and basically jacked up the price 3,000% and was asking families uh, of kids with this, this rare um, kidney disease to pay $300,000 a year uh, to keep their kid alive, basically, right? Um, and what they do is they give money to the patients to advocate on their behalf, right? So there are all these pharma-funded patient groups out there that pharma has basically co-opted to get them to go out there and say, look, we need the provincial government to cover this on their plan. We need insurers, private insurers, to cover this. Because as soon as you're charging hundreds of thousands of dollars for a drug, there's no actual market for that, right? Like there's no one, no one has that kind of money to like to pay for the drugs. But so they use those patient voices to basically push their commercial interests. And I think to neutralize criticism from these these groups. But there's there's a ton of people, you know, people like Erin Little who are out there and in her case, to her credit, they tried to buy her off and she said, you know, fuck you, like this is outrageous. This is bigger than then, me. Yeah. yeah, and this is bigger than me. And she had a social conscience about it and was like, yeah, you know, like she she had people donating her money because, you know, she and as, as she put it, she's like, yeah, my daughter is this cute little blonde girl. So, of course, people want to run GoFundMes for her. But if like if I was black, if my daughter was black, like, would they be doing that? You know, um, so it you know, does leave meeting, a lot up to chance. Right. Or privilege. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so meeting and connecting with people like that and bringing them into the campaign in some cases, people like Bill Swan, another patient advocate from, from Nova Scotia who's been working on this stuff since like the 80s, has COPD, ended up in hospital as a young man because he couldn't get a puffer because he, he lost coverage after he aged out of his, his father's plan. You know, and, and this, like, these people aren't special in the sense that this stuff happens to people 
every day, right? It's just happening all the time. Uh, there was a poll that was done recently and it showed 22% of Canadian households have someone who hasn't been able to afford their medication you know, in the last year, right? I think so that's, even with that experience level being high, there's still a lot of Canadians or people in Canada that, that don't realize how bad the lack of coverage is because there are some provinces that cover seniors, for example. And, you know, if you're lucky, you could go your entire life without needing regular medication. You kind of go from maybe your parents paying or being covered for medication. You kind of skirt through if you're lucky and you don't need it. And and you just assume everybody is in the same situation. And they'd be horrified to know that there are now some like chemotherapy drugs that aren't covered by OHIP. Anybody in Ontario knows what's being covered is less and less and less. Um, but that brings me to one of the critiques that I'm sure even you have about the legislation being introduced and the rollout, only including two classifications of drugs to begin with. Those folks need with diabetes, as well as contraception of a few different forms. I'm To, to my understanding, it's not just a birth control pill. Uh, nor is it just insulin, right? So they're kind of categories of drugs. That that doesn't even cover some of the folks that you were just talking about, right? Um, or the, the people that I was talking about. So what? how can we look at that critically, but also hopefully? I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a foot in the door. You know, we have a foothold kind of towards a bigger program because the legislation does lay out a process for expanding it to a bigger list of essential medicines, which most, you know, people who've looked at essential medicines, it's usually like the kind of drugs that your family uh, doctor, if you're lucky enough to have one, will prescribe you. Um, these are the most commonly prescribed drugs. So there is that in the legislation, which is positive. Um, but yeah, it started very small. And I think this is partly the revenge of, of big pharma and the insurance industry is, you know, I'm sure that this is something that the liberals, when they have those meetings with, with those lobbyists, they're telling them, they're like, don't worry, we're gonna give the people this much and no further, you know? And even, I mean, you can hear it, right? Like as soon as the legislation dropped, as soon as it was introduced, Mark Holland, uh, the liberal health minister, went out there and said, you know, I'm not ideological. I'm not sure if we should continue with a public single payer system, right? Even though report after report has shown that it's cheaper, it provides better coverage, will save us billions of dollars on drug costs. He still thinks we don't have enough data. He says, this is a, this is a proof of concept. You know, we're doing a pilot project, right? And we're gonna see, and the, the example he cited as an interesting kind of alternative to, to what we have been pushing for and what the NDP, to its credit, had been pushing for in the negotiations, public single payer pharmacare, the alternative is PEI, right? And PEI has a deal with the federal government where uh, they basically give a bunch of money to the provincial health plan, which is fine, right? It's, I mean, the, health, the federal government should be investing more in healthcare, but crucially, it's not single payer, right? And the importance of a program being single payer is that if you cover everybody and you have the federal government negotiating on everyone's behalf, you're able to negotiate down the price of these drugs, right? And that's what Big Pharma does not want to see. Right? For so that's many the, reasons. For so many reasons. They, they, that's what they're fighting tooth and nail. Because you look when the, uh, when the announcement that we were going to have pharmacare legislation coming came out with the supply and conference agreement back in March, 2022. <laughs> I'm only imagining the reaction. So you guys, your wheels started turning, but these folks are always thinking about Pharmacare already. They must've been like, oh shit. But that's the interesting thing is their re response was, we're pleased to hear this. And we hope that the federal government will go forward and strengthen our public private system, right? And so it's kind of weird because like, it took me a while to understand this because it's like, why the, why the hell does like Big Pharma care who's paying, right? They just want the highest price. That's for a their red drugs. flag, right? Their response. Yeah, is that's a red big flag. Red it's flag. Like, 
that's, that's the problem, is they don't want a single-payer public system, because then they're going to be in the same situation that they're in with virtually other, other, every other country with a developed healthcare system other than the US, right? Where you have some kind of universal pharmacare system and where the government negotiates centrally with these pharmaceutical companies and gets significantly lower prices, right? In Canada, we're paying the second highest prices in the world now. We were third for a long time. Now we've passed, I believe it was Germany. And so we're second only to the US. We're paying the second highest prices and we have tons of people who don't have insurance and we have tons of people who are covered by you know, really, yeah, really patchy, really inadequate in you know, uh, public insurance or private insurance. So, you know, that's what they're fighting against, right? And so they've, they've always taken this outward stance of, you know, okay, yes, pharmacare, but work within the existing system and don't, you know, they, they try to claim that it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up everything else if we do this single-payer system. So. Okay, I want to go back. Now it's time to talk about the budget. So I want to... Because my ears went up when you spoke about revenge from the industry, you know, in this kind of delayed rollout, because the announcement was for one point five billion. Like that was the number that was always not always floated out, but as part of these budget announcements that we got teasers for. Uh, But then we find out it's actually over five years with like less than 60 million for its first year. And you folks have done the work. You've done the math. You're telling us that it's about $3 billion to cover these two drugs. Um, so, because w- when the announcement came, they asked Jagmeet Singh about it, and he was skeptical even then. He seemed to know that there would be lacking funds in the budget. I. Uh, There was not much said about it at the time, but it was part of his initial announcement, like not to really expect much in the 2024 budget itself. And to me, that was just like another red flag. But the the reaction of the industry that you're talking about there, plus the the budget announcements, the details, you want to react to all that. Now, uh, the foundation is still there, but there's a real risk that it's not adequate enough for longevity is that yeah there's i think (laughs) it's weird because i'm i'm learning the nuances of budget process as we go (laughs) um so there is a possibility to kind of like up the amount of funding that is there for pharmacare as things go along um but it's definitely concerning like they should be announcing loud and clear, you know, the federal government should be announcing loud and clear to the provinces that this is going to be fully funded, um, that they're going to, you know, cover a significant chunk, if not all of the cost. I mean, like, you know, $3 billion on the federal budget of, what is it, I think 480 billion or something, it's like 0.6%. You know, it's, it's it's a rounding error in the federal budget. They could Easily, easily <laughs> tomorrow, just cover the whole thing, right? I'm and sure. So the very I'm fact sure you could find having, some of those in there. And be like, can we have that? Like, is that possible? Yeah. Anything that falls from the table, can you kind of beef up Pharmacare crumbs. a little bit? Yeah, it's. I, I think I was looking at like they, when they announced that they were going to have the federal civil service cut back on outside consultants and international travel. I think like the annual savings from that were something like five billion over three years or something. I mean. It's just like they're spending that much money just on <laughs> external consultants and fucking flying people. Because I'll tell you uh, what to do. Conferences. I'll do it for free because I'm so pissed <laughs> off about everything. You know, just yeah, it that must have been frustrating because like when you when I read your article back from February and rightfully so, you know, it was really celebratory, and you deserved a moment, but then I feel like. I get I get frustrated. Usually I blame the NDP and I focus my rage there because the messaging sometimes and and I'm I'm bad for this. Like I know we should celebrate any victories because we don't get very many. I understand the importance for the psyche, but I feel like that's just like not my job. So I apologize for everyone out there who feels like I just I shit on every victory. But I feel <laughs> like there's always gotta be someone in the room that's going you, we got to keep going 
please keep going. Like, please do not applaud these people. Like, please, like, please just look at them like Oliver and be like, can I please have some more? Like, but, but in a much more assertive way, right? Like at a time where your foot should be on the gas, uh, when that foot is in the door is, is not when you kind of lean back. It's when you push forward really aggressively to get in and make it stay there because we know the liberals aren't going to win the next election unless something crazy happens. And we know that the conservatives want nothing to do with pharmacare, let alone a single payer. Uh, so there's two risks, right, that I want to focus on because if you, you got to mitigate them somehow. Uh, the provinces could be a barrier, right? The, the rollout has complications there with getting them to agree, especially with this paltry sum, as well as the threat of the conservatives if it's not implemented. I've mentioned this before, but it's really... Imp- Kathleen Wynne did this to us in Ontario, so folks should remember we got all this great labor legislation, but she only introduced it when she knew she was about to lose an election. So it was, it might've been an attempt to win that election, but I think like the writing was on the wall. It was just to kind of placate the movements, I think to get them to pull back a little bit. Uh, And almost all of it, (laughs) I think all of it, I would be hard pressed to think of one bit of that, that bill, including the minimum wage that got canceled, that remained. And they knew it wouldn't because a lot of it had delayed rollouts or, um, you know, only applied to a small target group at the beginning. And so no one really missed it when they axed it, except the minimum wage. Like that really should have pissed people off. But um, and it did. But you know what I'm saying? Like, if, if something is entrenched, it's delivered to as many people as possible, it becomes way more difficult to come in and, and rip it away from them. That becomes a real political liability for people. But if it's just like this piecemeal thing that's not working, like dental care is gone. Like, they're not going to be able to save that from the conservatives because it's a fucking mess. And people will probably applaud them because of the bad media around it. So what can we do to pharmacare now uh, like, what's your plan of attack now that you've got uh, this budget? Yeah. I think you mentioned the provinces, and I think, yeah, that sort of um, is one of the elements of the legislation that is a double-edged sword, right? So it's it's good in the sense that it's not like dental care. It's actually a public program that will be administered publicly. So like dental care, they got Sun Life to be the company uh, that is administering. They basically took out a plan, uh, you know, with Sun Life for all of the people who meet the criteria um, uh, that they set out, which is crazy complicated. For a universal program, it makes sense. And they're running it through provincial uh, drug plans. And it kind of works like the health transfer where it's like the feds give you this money and you basically have to level up the coverage that you offer people. Do you have being, to? They have to, yeah. In the legislation, some of the they health have transfers to. have not the, a lot the, of strengths. Again, this is one of the weaknesses of the legislation is it's very clear for diabetes drugs and for contraceptives that it has to be first dollar, it has to, no out-of-pocket costs, it has to cover everybody. And then it says, okay, and then we're going to expand to essential medicines within a year of passing it, which will chances are happen uh, after the October 2025 election, unfortunately, but it'll be coming. Um, But there it's a little, there's a bit of gray area, right? And so if you read what like the insurance industry people are saying, uh, or the pharmaceutical funded, you know, think tanks, they're like, okay, yeah, well, next phases will be not universal, will be not single payer, will, you know, and so they're angling for that. So that, that's something that's, that's so hard of, to imagine. What a complicated mess that you'd have two sets of drugs on one and then a whole different system set up for the other. That seems yeah, unvaluable I mean, and it's, expensive. It's, I think I think the, the real end game, the immediate goal for us from here till the federal election is can we get as many provinces as possible to sign on and have as many people across the country as possible receiving their contraceptives, receiving their diabetes drug for free through their health card, you know, and can we make that happen before 
um, before October 2025. Because if, if this is still a program that is just on paper, you know, uh, there's nothing easier uh, for a future Polyev government to walk in and just tear it up. You know, say, okay, pharmacare is done. Taking away people's access to insulin, to their diabetes drugs, to their free contraceptives, it's going to be harder. I'm not saying, I mean, Polyev could do it, but it's going to be harder. And we'll, you know, I think we'll, we'll face that fight when we get there, if we get there. But I think the priority right now is to have as many provinces get on board and roll this out. We know a number of them are already favorable. I mean, <clears throat> the obvious ones being BC and Manitoba, where the NDP is in power provincially. Doug Ford says he needs to see some details and the usual suspects, Alberta and Quebec. What is their deal? I mean, before they even <laughs> see any details, they're like, no, fuck you, feds. Yeah. <laughs> we I love mean, being Quebec, a thorn in your side. Take that. Quebec is a foregone conclusion. I mean, I guess for Danielle Smith's UCP government, too. Um, been doing some digging on this because there are are some lobbyists who are have been hired by shoppers which is owned by Loblaws and they have been lobbying the provincial government on pharmacare uh, the the Alberta government on pharmacare <laughs> I'm like you have to clarify cuz that asshole was the first person to meet with Ford when he won so uh they're they're everywhere they're everywhere um and so yeah we've we've focused pretty much exclusively on the insurance companies and big pharma through this campaign. But I mean, there's just so much legitimate rage against Loblaws and they're clearly playing a role in pushing provinces to to kind of to fight back or reject the uh, national pharma care plan that I think, yeah, we, we're going to be we're going to be digging more into that and, and putting out some research soon on that. I feel like at this rate, Shoppers Drug Mart is going to be the single provider of medication for Ontarians. I mean, they had that deal with Manulife that they had to, I think, retract because people got so pissed off. But it just gives people an idea of how entrenched we've talked about Galen Weston, even in private clinics, medical clinics and buying the real estate that underneath them as well as our groceries and rental units um so the sway within government as you can imagine is massive so that's just like another layer on the your opponents but I, it's interesting because when when galen weston and the law laws people get called to testify and you know say why why are your food prices so damn high and they say, oh, you know, we're, we're, our profits are coming from pharmaceuticals. Don't worry. Nick's like, it's, sitting it's over all... there giving him the finger. Yeah, we fucking know. <laughs> no, thanks. Like, and everyone's supposed to be relieved at their grocery store. Oh, well, it's not here. It's when I go get my medication that they're really fucking me. And, or when I need money at the bank, they're getting my fees there. Because, yeah, like that was some sort of out for them. They're so disconnected from why we hate them. Um but let them let them remain oblivious. And and that's the you know that's the kind of thing like the deal that they they signed with Manulife was basically they were going to funnel everyone who has a plan uh, with Manulife into their stores, right? And if we move towards a, a universal public single payer system where people were were covered no matter where they are and no matter what what kind of job they have. Um, you know, that would be impossible. Like those deals would not be on the table for Loblaws. And they would also probably face scrutiny for the kinds of dispensing fees they're charging at their pharmacies because the federal government would be involved in that too. So, you know, yeah, they have some interests that uh, in, in seeing this National Pharmacare project fail. See, I know everyone's talking about housing a lot. I mean, everybody, well, we are because we can't afford it, but politicians are using housing as a real hot button issue. But when you talk about the level of lobbying that's involved with pharmacare and that one lobbyist for the innovative medicines of Canada being like the most influential person on the Hill, I can only imagine uh, there's going to be a lot centered on this and a lot riding on it for these lobbyists. Their money is clearly going to be in one camp here. I know they like to hedge their bets, which is great, and they still will, but they'll have a real incentive here to get the Conservatives to win because the Liberals, I don't think, are any position to back out of this or even to go back to uh, multiple... Mul what do you call it when it's not single-payer? 
multi-pair? Um, mixed or public private. Yeah. Multi, you <laughs> so know, it's dual, a dual pair. They, they refer to it as dual pair. That's their dual pair. Okay. Yeah. So, Although yeah. It's, it's really like tens of thousands of pairs because you have so many different plans. Yeah. I can't like but, yeah. see the liberals kind of having t- like th- that would just be a little bit messy. So I expect folks to hear about this on the campaign trail and the, the conservatives to try to make it a way, any issues that arise from pharmacare, uh, a bit of a wedge issue, the way that they're trying to do with dental. But I think it, the important part there that you're talking about rolling it out to as many people as possible is, although it's two categories of drugs, there are a lot of people and families impacted by diabetes, and I think everyone can understand why it's so important to have that medication. But it's impossible to measure the amount of people that would take advantage of the free contraception. So we might have numbers on people who use it or are of the age that one would use it, but I think that the cost of contraception has been a deterrent you know, an immeasurable uh, factor in a lot more. Because I've seen a lot of people kind of, and this is what happens when you have rollouts like this or means testing. It pits people against one another on a level. So there's people who have drugs they can't afford and they want a reason to include their drug and maybe not birth control, right? Like, why is birth control so important? So I know why it's so important. Do you want to, like... Uh, reflect on that and because right wing or left wing there's a lot of people out there that need contraception that would have better lives if they could control the amount of births that they had to experience or pregnancies rather that they had to experience yeah i mean it's it's a you know it's a cost barrier for a lot of women, I think especially lower income women, um, and, and especially for things like IUDs, um, which are included in the, the list of things that will be covered under this pharmacare plan. Um, the cost barrier is pretty substantial. So uh, yeah, having access to those like more effective, less, less likely to fail forms of birth control is, is huge. Um, you know, the government cited, I think, a figure of like 9 million women and, and other people uh, who need who need contraceptives that would benefit from this. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's going to affect a lot of people. And I think diabetes, likewise, it's there's there's tons of people who have diabetes. And I think people will understand pretty easily why this is necessary. But I think you're t- talking about a dynamic of like this kind of negative solidarity that we often, working class people often get into, right, where it's like, how come he has it so fucking good? What about me? You know, he should be suffering like I am, right? Like, that's kind of like, and you see it all the time, um, public sector versus private sector think, workers and stuff. And but, I think also uh, people, it's easy to look at birth control as not life-saving, even though it is. It definitely is for many, many people, not just to prevent a pregnancy, but for issues that they have with their health. They use uh, the birth control pill. I could go on. It. it we have. Uh, but it's... It, it's one of those easy ones where you could just be like, literally, this medication keeps me breathing and it's not covered. But, you know, something that a condom could do, you know, this is a real kind of uneducated mentality that's out there. But, yeah, it's definitely reminiscent of the same things that we we find reasons to punch across instead of up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But what's what's been interesting and I think it is a dynamic that works in the opposite direction is you have some patient groups and even ones that get some money from the pharmaceuticals have been coming out, you know, and I don't know how cynical maybe they're trying to get inside the policy process by doing this, but they've been saying, well, we should be next, you know, like cancer drugs need to be next or, you know, um, uh, drugs for, for heart disease should be next and so on. And so it's like, and of course, like, yeah, if there's a program there that's changing people's lives and giving them much better access to their medicines without having to pay huge amounts out of pocket. It's like, of course, you want to get on board and most people don't care, you know, like about the politics of the, of the program. Uh, they just see that this is something that is better and that could make things better for them. So yeah, I think there, that's something that, you know, like in the immediate aftermath of the, the introduction of the bill, there was a, a number of like radio national kind of call-in shows 
And, you know, a lot of people were pretty clear eyed about it. They were just like, yeah, I know like this isn't going to do anything for me, but I'm still really happy. And I hope this program expands. And I think, I think that's the kind of dynamic that, that is positive, the kind of positive solidarity that people see happening. Um, and that we're going to try to encourage as much as possible from here on out. Um, Cause I think, I think that's, that's how we can win things. And I think, yeah, we're used to kind of, you know, the Ontario experience that you're referring to where we kind of have this Hail Mary gains that are, are thrown at us by a failing government and then they get snatched away uh, just as quickly. But there are other instances where things have been built up and, you know, if people are organized enough, they can fight to keep them and even expand them. Um, we just got to do the work. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's tough, but we got to do it. What is the work then for people listening that, you know, want their health care drugs covered or they want this, they understand the importance of this program and the time frame in which they need to operate in? What should they be doing other than staying in touch with the Council of Canadians? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, we've been working to have people get out and do canvassing. Um, we're kind of, we're in, a, we're in a kind of like, we didn't expect to get this far, quite frankly. You know? like, <laughs> I, I was, love the I was, honesty. Yeah, no, um, no, no. And it's because, because you know, like, considering what we're up against, right? We were, we were, I was pretty prepared to just, you know, write a, a very angry analysis post being like, this legislation is crap, you know? <laughs> um, and then it's like, whoa, okay. It's actually not crap. It's actually, you know, in line, it has weaknesses and stuff, but it's in line with what we were campaigning for. So that was a big surprise. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're in a, in a phase now where we're, we're trying to build um, close relationships with the groups that have been fighting for contraceptives and reproductive health um, and reaching out to uh, groups of people who in the diabetes community who aren't being funded because some of the bigger groups are being funded by the pharmaceutical industry, but there are kind of networks and, and um, that's some shady and shit. Groups of people. Yeah. Oh, it's it's shady as hell. I mean, <laughs> you can't you can't That'd imagine be like how tenant shady. rights groups being funded by the landlords. It is exactly oh, that. Oh, yeah, that's another it's... episode, Nick. I That has <laughs> such cringe worthiness. But I love the idea of building a wider coalition because quite often folks try to reinvent the wheel or do that, that work that's really already been done, meaning organizing around uh, a health issue or whatever it is that's completely tied to what you're advocating for. Uh, that's really where folks start to make grounds because... Yeah, resources can be tight, so people power is important. Um, I mean, and I think I think like at an individual level, like I mean, yeah, it's tough to do things individually. I think in general, you know, if you're not going to join the Council of Canadians, join another group that's campaigning on pharmacare. Um, I think it's important. You need to get have organizations. And you need to get together with people in your community. So we're trying to facilitate that and 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 work with as many groups of people as possible, either through our chapters or even in places where we don't have chapters. Um, but I think, you know, also just talking to people like, you know, probably everybody knows, has maybe people in their family or in close friends who have diabetes, just like, you know, if you educate yourself a bit about the bill and talk to them and see if they know that this is coming and talk to them about it. Because like, I think some of the polling I've seen is like 50% of people don't even know like anything about the pharmacare legislation, right? Um, and, you know, had this experience shortly after the legislation dropped where we got a we got an op-ed in the Toronto Star kind of laying out why we thought this was this was good and it was a victory against big pharma and the insurance companies and I wanted to go buy it and I happened to be in Toronto um, in a kind of north north part of Toronto I can't remember the name it was it wasn't North York but it was not far from there and I just went to all the all the corner stores I was gonna say Dippiners the corner stores in the area seeing trying to get a paper trying to get a Toronto Star and like nobody had newspapers we call them you know? convenience stores convenience stores there you go <laughs> they're um, not always on the corner <laughs> yeah and I went to like three of them and I asked them and they're like oh no people don't read the newspaper you know? <laughs> it's just like yeah it's, okay. well, it's behind a paywall you know? for me I never see the phys yeah. I'm up in the boonies here uh, north of uh, Toronto but 
Aw. Yeah. So you still don't so, have a copy of that? I, I did. Someone I got, got a copy. Do I have a copy? Yeah, I got a copy. I actually. But your point <laughs> was, we don't. Is, we just watched CP24 I, here in Ontario. I think it's on in the hospital waiting rooms for us. So we're there a long time. That's where we're supposed to get our news. Yeah. So, so yeah. So there's there's a lot of, um, you know, just like basic education of like people within your family. If you happen to be, you know, uh, know more about this issue, just like ask around and share share stuff. Yeah. Um, I actually got this. <laughs> <laughs> it's very silly. I got this copy, paper copy of the Toronto Star, out of the garbage of a shopper's drug mart because uh, <laughs> I got went the day after. And I was like, "Do you have yesterday's paper?" And they're like, "Well, it's in the garbage." I'm like, I, I don't, don't mind. care. Like, I'll take every copy. Mom, yeah. <laughs> Dad, I, that's so funny you say that <laughs> too because funny. I totally get it. Santiago, our producer, he's got a piece coming out for Humber. Uh, they do a magazine every year. And I, I'm like a mom. I feel like I'm just like, you make sure you get me a good copy. Not a crease copy. Don't fold it and put it in your bag. I, I get Maybe get another copy. Don't forget to get your parents a copy. And he's like, oh, no, I know, I know. And, you know, we're excited for its release. It matters. That's, it's not silly. Um, it's important. Thank you, Nick, for coming on and for doing this advocacy work. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a grind. Uh, but we will link folks to your campaigns, the op-ed you've referenced, and a whole bunch of the, the work that you folks are doing. And, yeah, folks can check out Council of Canadians, not for Canadians. That's I, I made that mistake at the beginning of the episode. This is much better, of Canadians. <laughs> um, and also, you mentioned health coalitions. We've interviewed members from the Ontario Health Coalition, but they're also in a lot of small towns too, in, including the big cities. But uh, if you can't find a chapter uh, for the Council of Canadians, that is a definitely another way that you can push back against this, you know, private industry lobbying and, and be part of the, the good guys. Um, but thank you, Nick, for coming on the show too. And uh, brightening my view of pharmacare because like anything that comes out of this CASA deal, I just, I, you know, um, heavy bias. I, I don't want to believe anybody in government anymore. And so sometimes I need a, a calm head to, uh, show me those bright spots, the things that are worth fighting for there. Yeah. Well, glad to be a hopeful voice. <laughs> That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.